growing up in my house, I was often commandeered uh, from my, my own weekend adventures to do chores around the house and the, and the garden uh, instead of climbing trees or playing hockey or, or baseball in the street, we were press ganged, me and my brothers, into the cruel and unusual punishment of, of yard work. Um, especially in the beginning, we had, we'd moved what into what would be my childhood home, and over the next few summers, my father had, had cultivated a, a beautiful uh, vegetable garden, and my mom had done the, the front of the house really nicely, um, all on the backs of me and my brothers. Um, but <laughs> what I... What I learned was that gardening, um, farming, maybe takes, takes a lot of work. Um, there's digging and, and weeding, uh, and with my father's greedy eyes tracing out the edge of the vegetable garden a couple of inches every year until it was big enough for him or for our, our family to eat from. Uh, you know, preparing it for a fruitful season by, by breaking up the ground and turning in compost. Um, but for all that work, when it came to actually making the little seedlings grow into tomatoes and courgettes and lettuces. We just had to sit back and, and wait. And the, the parable that, that we read earlier in, in the year in Mark chapter uh, 4 compares the kingdom of God to this picture. Right? The, the farmer scatters the seed. He might labor to remove rocks and weeds, but um, especially before we had on-demand water from our garden hoses, then the farmer had to depend on something else to nourish and to grow the seed so that it might uh, grow and, and bear fruit. In our study in the life of Jesus in this book of Mark, we've, we've just seen Jesus rejected by his own hometown. Right? And immediately after this, Jesus sends out his disciples, right? this small group of, of 12, uh, to kind of expand his ministry. And his, his instructions to them when he sends them out reveal something to us uh, about working for the kingdom of God, working in this system that's like the farmer uh, sowing seed and, and waiting for it to grow. The, the response to them uh, from the king uh, that we read reveals another story about working for the kingdom, and, and so does the final part of our passage this morning, uh, the feeding of the 5,000. And as we work our way through the passage of Mark um, from chapter 6, verse 7 through to 44, we might, we might get the sense, I think we'd be right to, uh, to sense that the invitation to kingdom work really ought to come with with a warning. All right, so it's something that says, you know, warning may, may require detachment. That's the word that comes to my mind. <laughs> may, may require detachment. And stick with me, because I think this will, this will bear itself out as we walk through our section, uh, each section of the passage this morning. And the, in the first section of our passage, Jesus sends out uh, his 12 disciples as an extension of his ministry and a kind of training exercise for them, I think, as well. Uh, sending them out, uh, Jesus teaches that kingdom work may require detachment, first of all, uh, from the things of this world. Read with me from, from chapter 6 and verse 7, if you have a Bible. Um, and it says, Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Uh, he charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from that place. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and, and healed them. Jesus calls these, these 12 Right, these men specially selected to be with him is what uh, Mark said in chapter 4. Right, if we remember his invitation for them to follow him in, in chapter 1, at least the four of them was, follow me and I will make you into fishers of, of men. And so here we really see this uh, bearing itself out. His instructions in sending them out teach us that uh, work in God's kingdom might require uh, detachment from the things of this world. Jesus sends them out with instruction designed to teach them to trust the source, uh, the supply, and the strength of God's activity through them. Firstly, if we just look at this first little section, uh, they, they learn to trust the, the source of kingdom work when Jesus sends them and gives them authority over the unclean spirits. Right? Their ministry was, was his ministry. 
And it, it flowed from him to them. The, the final verses in this little section also give us a picture, verses 12 and 13, of what they did. They, they preached, they cast out demons, they healed the sick. Their ministry mirrored Jesus' ministry. E- even their message was not their own. Right? Verse 12 says, they proclaimed that people should repent. This was the same message that, that Jesus preached. It was the same one that John the Baptist preached, uh, both in, in chapter 1 at the beginning of the book. And they are sent out from him, invested with his authority to do his ministry. And this teaches them to put their trust in, in the source of their kingdom work and not to do their own thing. As God's people now, in the age of the church, we are invested with, with more than just a message, more than just borrowed authority, because we as Christians are the, the dwelling place of God himself by his Holy Spirit. So, so how much more should we be careful to trust the source of our work? Do we trust the source of our ministry enough not to mess with the message we've been given? Right? Even, even in the face of maybe falling church numbers or rising doubt in our world, right? these trends that churches have been worried about for, for decades now, especially in the West, we forget that in, in the global South and in other countries, actually Christianity is spreading rapidly. Um, will we trust the source of our ministry enough not to change the message? Right? Like the Apostle Paul commanded Timothy before he died, he said, guard the good deposit given to you. You've been entrusted with something, so take care of it. Secondly, these, these disciples must learn to trust the king to supply for his kingdom work. Right? When Jesus sends them out, he only allows them to take the bare minimum. A, a single staff, no, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts. No food or place to store, some that they might pick up along the way even. They're to trust that the Lord will provide what is needed for their ministry. Even when they, they come into a village, they're not to leave the first house that welcomes them. Right? A, a first century Jewish village would be very hospitable. So this it probably wasn't as daunting to them to walk out with no place to stay as, as it would be to us. Um, many Middle Eastern houses even today have this same sense. It's a culture of, of rich hospitality. They look after you well, but Jesus specifically tells them not to, not to go looking for a better house. You know, if the first person brings them in, it's, it's, a, nice, you know, it's a nice welcome. But you know, they meet a couple of other people who live in nicer houses. He says, don't, don't move on from that place. God's workers are called to be content. Right, to be detached from the things of this world, not, not eager to always have the best or even the things that are, that are better. The Apostle Paul, again, write, writing from prison, said, I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. He said, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. I know um, how to have much, how to have little. In, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret, he says, of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So as, as you face ministry challenges, remember that, that God's workers are called to trust. Trust kingdom, uh, the, the king to supply for kingdom work. This work requires detachment, again, from the things of this world. Finally, the, the disciples are, are taught in their commissioning in this first section to trust the strength of their message. This, this connects very closely to the first point, right? Because the, the strength of their message is tied directly to the source of their message. They, they preach the same gospel of repentance that John the Baptist and Jesus had, and especially because they had just come from Nazareth where Jesus had been rejected, and they had watched his hometown uh, essentially kick him out. They, they learned in their ministry to trust the strength of the gospel and, and not to weaken it or make it relevant or attractive. Because right? Jesus told them in... in um, in verse 11. Right? If, they do, if they do not listen to you or receive you, shake the dust off your feet as a witness against them. Why do that unless, um, unless it's true that, that the message is enough? It, it, if that wouldn't be true, they would need to change the message until the people would welcome them and would accept them. But Jesus tells them to, to shake the dust off their feet. This is something Jewish rabbis would do when they left Gentile territory. Right, when they left the unclean territory as a sign that they, they rejected the uncleanness of these people, they would shake the dust off their feet. And Jesus calls his disciples to do this to those places that reject his message. The strength of kingdom ministry lies in its message. The righteous God who calls us to repent doesn't need to be made relevant or attractive. He's, 
He, he's the creator, like Leo was praying, which means his love um, and his mercy, I'm sorry, it means that, that his will that's been revealed in his word, uh, that, that his reality that's, that's shown in creation is, is over all things. And so he's, he's relevant to every single human on the planet because he made them. But he's, he's also the redeemer, right, which means that um, the love and the mercy we see in the message of the cross is, is beautiful. We don't, we don't have to make him beautiful or make him relevant. He is that on his own. Uh, may we learn right, from this story as the apostles did to trust in the strength of the kingdom and the king's message. Once again, the, the apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. The Jew first and the Greek, it, it crosses boundaries. It is enough. This, this first section, this first part of our passage teaches us to depend on God, and it sets the tone for the rest of our, our uh, time this morning, right? to, to detach ourselves from the things of this world is what it encourages us to do. And when we come to verse 14, we, we get a sense of the scope of Jesus' ministry, uh, especially through his disciples, because now it's been expanding through them, and word has even reached Herod, right? the, the king of Galilee, this little corner of, of um, the land of, of Israel. The expansion of, of Jesus' ministry through his disciples has made so much noise uh, that, that the king is now paying attention. That's what verse 14 said, that, that Jesus' name had become known. So as we walk through this next section, we, we get another picture, um, maybe a rather a messy illustration of the truth that, that kingdom work may require detachment, even detachment from uh, alliances with this world. It's, it's interesting that the story of, of Herod and, and of John the Baptist comes here. Right? In, in, in between the disciples going out in verse 12 and, and then coming back to Jesus in verse 30. It seems kind of to, to break up the narrative, but I think one clear reason Mark has kind of sandwiched it in here is, is for Herod's reaction. Right? The word of Jesus has reached all the way up to the king. He's becoming known, and there's a discussion about who this man is. Herod we read, is, is worried because he believes John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and so this launches us into this story about uh, John the Baptist. And what we have found out is that Herod had had John arrested right, because he spoke out against Herod and his wife, Herodias, who had been married to Herod's brother, Philip. And because of this, verse 19 tells us that Herodias, the, the wife, uh, had a grudge against John and wanted to put him to death. Uh, but we read that she couldn't because Herod feared John. He respected him. Uh, he knew that he was a man of, of righteousness. He was a holy man. And so Herod kept him safe. Remember the, the message of the disciples and the message of Jesus. The, the thing that connects this little story to the one before it, right, the, the piece of continuity is, is the, the message. The disciples had been preaching that people must repent. And here we have John uh, who's in prison for preaching the exact same message. Here, this is what you ought not to be doing. Kingdom work requires detachment from alliances to this world, you know, potentially even strong alliances that, that could maybe send the gospel out as, as far as possible, but if, if they are compromising, uh, kingdom work requires detachment from, even from alliances with people in this world. One thing Mark highlights for us is the opposition that comes because of this message. Right? It, one thing we can see is that if this, if this is John's fate for preaching repentance, right? if Jesus has just been run out of his hometown for preaching this message, then what should, what should we expect? Right? One of the many dangers of, of running the church like a, a corporation or a business, models that many churches have, have picked up, is that we might, we might come to view the people around us uh, in terms of, of marketing. They become a, a, a demographic to appeal to. That our community instead becomes uh, consumers with, with needs, not, not the lost needing a savior. How many, how many churches could we count up who have lowered the bar of gospel truth in, a, in a, you know, what is a good heartfelt effort to reach people, but how many have lowered the bar of gospel truth just to get people in the door? Again, we should, we should never be ashamed of the gospel nor, nor so afraid of, of declining church numbers that we hold back from the truth so that people could, could come in to hear a, a different part of it. That's what this teaches us, is that opposition is, is par for the course. 
not only does the, the promise of opposition we see in, in John's life teach dependence on God, there you go. but also uh, the promise, uh, the d- dependence on God is taught in the deception of, of earthly allies. Herod, we read in verse 20, he, he feared John. He respected him as a righteous and holy man. He protected him uh, from the anger of his wife. And then uh, at the end of verse 20 even says, when Herod heard John, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. He, he, he was fond of, of John and the things he said, even if they were confusing or weird at times. Herod heard him gladly. But what may look like an alliance will ultimately be, be disappointing because Herod quickly compromises. And verse 19 had said that his wife had been looking for a way to kill John, and verse 21 picks this up, saying an, an, an opportunity came up. Not just an opportunity for Herod to have a birthday, but his birthday was an opportunity for his wife to have her revenge. Herod's stepdaughter, uh, who's described as a young girl, went, went into the banquet and, and danced for Herod and his guests. And he was so entertained that he, he promised her anything she wanted. After asking her mother, uh, she, she returned and asked for the head of, of John the Baptist on on a platter. Mark tells us that, that Herod was greatly troubled, exceedingly sorry, he says. But because of the guests, because of his, his promise, and because of public disgrace, he sent the executioner who brought the head of this holy and righteous man, John. Alliances with this world are, are dangerous things for Christians. Not that we should not do business or, or not work together with others and not that we shouldn't try to partner up with those who have similar values. Uh, I've heard from, uh, of people in the States uh, saying that some of our best allies against the cultural shifts uh, of our day, against things like the, the sexual revolution and, and the breaking down of things that Christians have always held to be true because the Bible teaches them quite plainly. Some of our best allies are other social, social conservatives, uh, like Mormons and, and Muslims, uh, who hold to the same thing. We should never allow these alliances to shake our dependence on God. Because Herod is is a picture. He would rather kill someone he knew to be righteous and holy than to lose face in front of his guests, to go back on a promise to a a little girl. Christianity might have moments where this world is perplexed by us, but, but listens to us gladly. But they're not aligned with us. John learned himself, and, and he teaches us uh, that faithfulness to the kingdom may require detachment. It requires detachment. We, we saw firstly from the things of this world, uh, from alliances with the people of this world. Finally, our, our passage this morning teaches that kingdom work may require detachment from the, the pressures of this world. Verse 30 tells us that when the apostles returned to Jesus and told them all that they'd done, all that they'd taught, right, he, he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. After their journey, the disciples reported back to Jesus all they'd, all they'd done, the, the things they had taught the people. He was the source of their message, and so they, they returned to him to, um, I suppose, get, get feedback or to, to, to bring the report to him. And in turn, Jesus invites them to, to go away to a quiet place to seek refreshment. Ministry is, is draining. You all know this. And I, I have the privilege of, of working here, but everything, something, something that's been on my mind from the first day I started, everything that, that every one of you do, you do on top of your, your nine to five. And it is, it is humbling to see you all serve so much. You, you know that ministry is draining. Like not only does it take physical work, not only does it take time from your schedule, emotional investment, uh, but there's something spiritual about doing ministry. And there's something different about pouring yourself out for those you minister the gospel to. Even if it's a, a very practical uh, image of the gospel, like, like a meal or a conversation. And Jesus knows this too. I remember his own example from back in chapter 1. And in chapter 1, verse 35, Jesus himself, after a long day and night of ministry, he gets up early in the morning and goes away to a desolate place. The same phrase, a desolate place, an isolated place to pray. So when when his disciples have come back from their journeys of ministry, Jesus invites them to practice dependence on God by stepping away from ministry for the sake of rest. 
Right? It's not just physical rest he wanted to give. I mean, he was, he was getting up before dark, we read in chapter 1, to go away and to pray. That's not exactly um, something doctors would say you should do um, all the time, the, the intense early wake-ups Jesus would do, especially after the long, long into the night ministry. Now, the, the rest he invites them into is spiritual. Come away to a desolate place and rest a while, he says. Jesus pulls them out of active ministry. Right? It says there were so many coming and going, they didn't even have leisure to eat. He pulls them out of active ministry to come and rest because there is spiritual rest they need, a rest which can only be found in God's presence and in solitude. He calls them to come away because they need to learn dependence on God and, and spiritual nourishment. Right? God is um, spiritual nourishment, spiritual food. He is our, our spiritual refreshment. And so he calls them into this, this desolate place to remind them that God has always fed his people in these, in these wilderness places. He fed Elijah by the stream, if you know the story. He fed David on the run. He even provided water for Hagar, and she'd been kicked out, mistreated. The one that springs to our minds really easily is he provided food for his people Israel in the wilderness by sending bread from heaven every day for them to eat. In desolate places, we find uh, that spiritually, God is our rest and our refreshment. He himself is our feast and our food. But we run into a problem. All right, Jesus and his followers had become just too well known. Verse 33 tells us that while they were you know, hopping in the boat and sailing away to uh, a different part, trying to find a little quiet corner of the lake, the people, it says, recognized them, and they ran there on foot ahead of them from all the towns. And when Jesus got on shore, he saw this great crowd. And, and his response is to have compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And says so he began to teach them many things. Jesus here is pictured as, as Moses or as the, the, the new Joshua. He's the, the leader of God's people who will instruct them in the wilderness. If you'd like, you can go home and, and meditate on this verse and the connection to Numbers, chapter 27, verse 17. But, but for now, the, the story keeps us moving. This picture is a little bit too deep to go into now. The story keeps moving because it's, it's getting late where they are. They'd come out to rest and found a bigger crowd there than they'd ever had before, and, and so... As it gets late, his disciples come to him and they say, Jesus, can you just, just get rid of them? You, you took us out here to have a break. Uh, I mean, they, they say it's slightly nicer. This is a desolate place, they say. You know, the hour's late. Send, send them away. Let them go buy bread in the countryside villages uh, and towns. And Jesus' response is a bit startling. He turns to them and says, well, why don't you give them something to eat? And his disciples, as ever, are as practical as they are, um, as, they, as practical as they were in the middle of the storm as well. They, they say to him, should we go and buy 200 days wages of bread? Jesus, where are we going to get 30 grand to buy enough food for, for all of these people? So Jesus asks them, how many, how many loaves do you have? They said, five. And we've got two fish, but I don't, I don't think that's going to help. And so Jesus gets this group, this massive crowd, and he sits them down on the side of the hill. And they're kind of dotting the, the landscape like garden plots there in, in the wilderness. A hundred over here and 50 over there. It's this huge crowd. And then we read Jesus taking these five loaves and two fish. He, he lifts them up to heaven and gives a blessing and, and broke them. And he gives them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all and they, and they all ate and all were satisfied. And afterwards they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate were 5,000 men. Jesus reminds his disciples of, of many things in this miracle. Again, it has more significance than we can squeeze into our time today. But let me, let me just touch on two things. The first is, is clear. It's, it's dependence on God. It's what we've been looking at all day. Hadn't Jesus told them not to take anything with them on their journey? Didn't they, didn't they come back to him excited about all they had taught and done? They must have had stories of how the Lord had provided for them on these trips, and they'd just come back to Jesus and were looking forward to time away. But um, Jesus, again, illustrates God's provision by providing a space, again, for dependence. Maybe in the, in the first instance, it was a bit easier to be dependent on God because it was, it was kind of their strategy. 
Right? They, they'd planned for it. They'd planned to have lack. They, they went willingly without things. But here, this lack, it, it intrudes into their lives because of an interruption of a well-deserved break. So are, are, they, are they able to be dependent even now? Is, is the God they've just relied on real enough, big enough, for this interruption into their, into their story? And this one butts up against, against the second thing, and that's detachment. Yes, de- detachment from the pressures of this world was the reason they came out to the wilderness, right? to, to rest, to, to get away from all the things clamoring for their attention. But just as God can provide food in this interruption, so he can provide rest in the midst of ministry. After all, it's, it's God providing for the people, isn't it? Not, not the disciples. He didn't send them to go buy 200 days worth of bread and to lug it back into the, into the desert. It's God providing for the people. So detachment from the pressures of this world is not only running away to escape them, but trusting God enough in the midst of them that he is enough for the disciples and for the crowds, for us and for our ministries. It's significant, once again, that Jesus is the source of the food, and he, he breaks it and gives it to the disciples to distribute. And afterwards, we, we read there are 12 full baskets one for each of the disciples. God will provide for his people. Kingdom work requires uh, detachment, even from the, the pressures of this world. These stories, they teach us dependence on God. I had a, a real, all-encompassing knowledge of his, his, uh, his purpose, his, his character, right? that, that he will that he can, that, that he desires to take care of his people. So you who are tired from your ministry, you who are, are hungry for a rest from the pressures of work, or the pressures of daily family life, the pressures of, of the society, Jesus invites us to radical dependence. He invites us to a rest in, in his work. Maybe you find yourself restless, but you don't know who this Jesus is. And the things of this life haven't offered a rest. There's nothing you can really depend on. The the short version of the story is that he, Jesus, like the food in the wilderness, has provided for us when we had nothing. And he invites us not to, to do enough to earn his love, not to provide our own food, but to accept what he has done for us, to make a way for us to God. This way that he has made is not just for us, but on this Mission Sunday, it's, it's for all who are weary. And so we remind ourselves of, uh, of the call, uh, that we as his people are called to kingdom work. And as exciting as this is, let's not miss the warnings from Mark's gospel, what faithful kingdom work looks like. It, it may require detachment. Detachment from the things of this world, detachment from alliances with this world, detachment Uh, blessed detachment even from the pressures that face us. God has called us to kingdom work and he is faithful. Let's go out from this place in dependence on him and on him alone. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your provision for us in your son. We thank you on this day for your word, this living book, which reveals you to us in the face of your son. Thank you for the illuminating power of your spirit who shines through the pages into our hearts to transform us into the image of Christ. Teach us, Lord, to listen, to trust, to depend on you.